welcome to week 6. In this week, we will be looking into the memory hierarchy design and of course, cache memory. In previous week, we discussed about memories. We discussed about static memories, dynamic memories, RAM. We also discussed about how we can actually design larger memory modules from smaller memory modules and memory interleaving. In this week, we will be looking mostly into how we can actually increase, how we can actually increase the improvement, uh, how we can improve memory how we can make memory more faster by incorporating some uh, strategies. So, one of the method that we will be seeing in more detail is the cache memory thing, which will be coming in uh, this week lecture. And uh, let us see that in this lecture, we will be focusing on memory hierarchy design. So, this is something which is very important that the we the programmers we always want unlimited amount of memory with a very low latency. So, we need high speed and we need more memory. We have also seen that fast memory technique technology is more expensive per bit than slower memory like SRAM. SRAM is much more expensive than DRAM, but DRAM is again more expensive than disk. So, uh, SRAM cannot be made much larger, where DRAM can be made much larger compared to SRAM. Again, DRAM cannot be made larger as disk and disk speed cannot be, you cannot match the speed of DRAM with disk as well. So, what is the possible solution we can have? Organize the memory system in several levels, which is called memory hierarchy and exploit both temporal and spatial locality on computer programs. We will look into the details of what is temporal and spatial locality. And we also try to keep the commonly accessed segment of program or data in a faster memory like in cache memory. So, by this what we mean is that the frequently used data or instructions can be kept in a high speed memory and whenever uh, because a particular data which I am requiring now, it might happen I will be requiring it after some time again. So, instead of keeping it in a slower memory, let us keep it in a fast memory and as and when it is required by the processor, it can get it from the faster memory, not from the slower memory. So, this results in faster access time on an average. So, let us have a quick review on the memory technology that we discussed last week. Static RAM, which is very fast, but expensive memory as it requires 6 transistor per bit and the packaging density is limited. So, within a small area, uh, we cannot have very large memory in place. Whereas, dynamic RAM, it is significantly slower than DRAM, uh, significantly slower than this will be SRAM sorry, but much less expensive that is only 1 transistor per bit is required. And it also requires periodic refreshing as which is not required in static RAM. So, dynamic RAM is much slower than static RAM, but it is much less expensive and also it requires periodic refreshing which is not required in static RAM. And flash memory is a non-volatile memory technology that uses floating gate MOS transistors. It is of course, slower than DRAM but has higher packaging density and lower cost per bit. And magnetic disk, it provides large amount of storage and the cost per bit is also 
pretty less, but it is much much slower than DRAM and also flash memory. And compared to other memories, this requires a mechanical moving part that uses magnetic recording technology. So, the disk moves around and uh, we actually get the data from different tracks and sectors we need to move. So, the disk is moving and we are retrieving data accordingly. So, there is a moving part whereas, in DRAM, SRAM no such kind of things are there. Coming to memory hierarchy, the memory system is organized in several levels. By hierarchy that is what we mean, it is divided into many levels. Using progressively faster technologies as we move towards the processor. So, the meaning is that there are different levels of memory hierarchy and we are saying that the level which is closest to the processor is much more faster and which are little farther from the processor which is little slower than the fast memory which is closer. So, which is closer to the processor it is much faster, but which is little far away from it it is slower than that. The entire addressable memory space is available in the largest, but slowest memory typically magnetic disk or flash storage. Like the, the addressable space when we are saying it is as large as your data on the disk, but we are actually incrementing the levels one by one by one. So, at the lowest level when we have cache which is much smaller, then we go to next level which can be L2 cache or it can be even main memory. It can be little more larger than that, but see in that slower when we say that we have this much of small memory in which is closest to the processor, we can only keep that much amount of data at a time, but how we can then speed up? We can transfer, we can get more data by replacing the data which is currently in that particular fast memory. We will move it to the slower memory, again from the slower memory we will bring the data into the faster memory. This is how we perform the things. So, we incrementally add smaller, but faster memories each containing a subset of data stored in memory below it. So, we proceed in steps towards the processor. Let us see this typical hierarchy starting with the closest to processor. So, which is closest to processor is the processor register. We know that processor register is also some storage unit which is inside the processor. So, which is closest to the processor basically. Then we have level 1 cache typically divided into separate instruction and data cache. We have already talked about uh, Howard and von Neumann architecture initially in the first week. There if you recall uh, we said that if we have separate data memory and instruction memory then instruction fetch and data access can be done at the same time. So, this is where we are coming exactly that we typically uh, divide them into instruction cache and data cache. We can have level 2 cache, we have level 3 cache, we then have main memory and finally, we have secondary memory. So, processor cache will be the smallest one, then the level 1 cache, then this, then this, then this and the secondary memory will be the largest memory, but as well as slowest this will be the fastest, then this, then this, then this and then. So, as we move away from processor what increases? The size of course, increases. So, this is the smallest one, then the size increases little more, little more the cost also decreases because as you are closest to the processor which is much faster you have to pay more cost to it, but as we are moving away from the processor the cost slowly slowly decreases, but at the same time the speed also decreases. So, this is a trade off you can see. Similarly, cost decreases and speed also decreases. Let us see this, this is processor registers level 1 cache we have instruction and data cache, then level 2 cache, level 3 cache, main memory and magnetic disk. 
as we move from processor to magnetic disk, the size increases. Size of this is less than this, this is less than this, this is less than this. So, the size of magnetic disk is the maximum, but as you move up the speed increases as well as the cost increases. So, the cost becomes much much more as you are moving to the memory hierarchy which is closest to the processor. So, this is basically a pyramid structure basically which shows registers then level 1 cache then level 2 cache and so on. So, the size is increasing, but there are few things which is also decreasing with the size. Now, this is a comparison that has been made registers the typical access time is in picosecond, level 1 cache is 1 to 2 nanosecond, level 2 cache is 5 to 20 nanosecond. So, the access time is increasing, increasing slowly, slowly. And at the same time, if you see the capacity, capacity is also increasing. Some other features, this registers and L 1 cache and L 2 cache can be on chip and level 3 can be off chip or it can be on chip as well and this is of course, outside this. So, what is the major obstacle in memory system design? We have already seen this slide before processor is much faster than main memory. This is the processor speed, the growth of the processor speed and this is the growth of the memory. So, basically you see this gap is always increasing, increasing and increasing. So, memory speed cannot be increased beyond a certain point. That is why we are coming up with so many techniques through which we can actually increase the speed uh, we can have uh, this speed can be much much uh, uh, we can improve the speed of the memory. So, that the access time can be much much less. So, let us see the impact of processor and memory performance gap. Over the years you can see this is the CPU clock with CPU clock this will be the clock cycle time and this is the memory access time. So, what is happening that the clock cycle time and the memory access time, the gap is increasing, the gap is increasing. The processor clock speed is becoming higher, higher and higher. With that, the clock cycle time is getting reduced, but the gap between this clock cycle time and the memory access is much, much more. So, minimum CPU stall cycles can be given by this. So, 190 memory access time divided by cycle time minus 1. So, which is coming to 0 0.5. So, it is increasing. So, the data is provided till 2004 which shows that minimum CPU stall cycle will be 179. So, this is the ideal memory access time one CPU cycle which can never happen in real memory access time is much much more than this one cycle time. So, memory latency reduction techniques what, what uh, how we can reduce the access time. Access time if it is reduced, what are the techniques that can be used? One is faster DRAM cell that will depend on PLSI technology that is used, wider memory bus width with fewer memory access needed. We have larger width, so we access once and we get the data all together. So, actually you are in making more area in a chip multiple memory banks, we can have memory interleaving. Integration of memory controller with processor, we can also use some emerging RAM technologies. And under memory latency hiding techniques, we have memory hierarchy, 
using SRAM based cache memory, we will be discussing in detail this. So, we are having a fast memory and we will say that most of the access will be made using this particular memory. Prefetching instruction or data from memory before they are actually needed will also help. Prefetching is a technique which can be used to hide this uh, memory latency uh, can be even made lesser. Now, coming to locality of reference, what we mean by locality of reference? There is a property that programs tend to reuse data and instruction they have used recently. That means, we say that an instruction which I am using at time t, it is much likely that I will be using that particular instruction at some point of time very soon. So, this by this is called locality of reference. That means, the rule of thumb says that 90 percent of the total execution time of the program is spent in only 10 percent of the code. So, what do you mean by that? We mean that this 90 percent of the total execution time that we are spending for a program is spent in only 10 percent of the code. And this is called 90 by 10 rule. Why this is happening so? Only 10 percent of the code is being used because of loops. So, what is a loop? If you consider a loop that we have certain statement and certain instructions are getting executed repeatedly. That means, we are executing a set of instruction repeatedly. So, if we bring those instruction into some faster memory and as we are using as loops are common in programs. So, you can actually have a better access time now, because you have brought the data from a slower memory into a faster memory and now you are accessing repeatedly from the faster memory. That is why cache can be helpful in such scenario. Although we are bringing the data from one memory to another memory, but in turn we are getting advantage out of it. So, the reason here is nested loops in a program as I just now said, few procedure calling each other repeatedly, arrays of data items being accessed sequentially. And also another thing is like if you consider an array, let us say this is an array of 100 elements. So, this array of 100 elements you will access first element, you will access next element and so on. So, actually you are making an access to some memory location let us say 2000, then 2004, then so on. So, if an instruction which is or data is required in which is a in some location. It is expected that data in the nearby locations is also required at near in the near future. So, instead of bringing only this we can bring the whole set of array together into the cache. So, this is where it helps this cache or this locality of reference is coming into picture. So, there are two things we call it spatial locality of reference, we call it temporal locality of reference, we will come into that little later. So, the basic idea to exploit this rule is based on programs recent past, we can predict with a reasonable accuracy what instructions and data will be accessed in near future. As I just now said the 90 by 10 rule has two dimension, one is called temporal locality, locality in time. That means, if I am accessing an element at time t, it is likely that I will be accessing that same instruction at time t plus something. So, if an item is referenced in memory, it will tend to be referenced again very soon because of loops. Spatial equality that is locality in space. So, if an item is referenced in memory, nearby items will tend to be referenced soon. That means, let us say 
uh, we have written a code and that code takes some um, say 20 uh, words, it takes 20 words to store that particular program. Now, if you take one one word at a time, it will not help, because when you are bringing one particular uh, word, it is likely that we require 20, uh, 19 more words associated with that program. So, why not to bring the entire thing into cache memory, such that next time when you are accessing, you are requiring that instruction, you will get it from the cache memory and not from the main memory, but you have already spent some time bringing the data from a slowest memory to uh, faster, fastest memory and then you are sending it to the processor. So, this is spatial locality. Let us take this example of temporal locality. Recently executed instructions are likely to be executed again very soon. So, the example is computing factorial of a number. So, here what we are doing, we are doing writing some instruction add immediate where t 1 is set to 1, t 2 is set to n and t 3 is set to 1. And in this loop, we are multiplying t 1 which is set to 1 with t 3 and then we are adding t 3 with 1 and then we are seeing that whether t 3 is greater than t 4 is greater than t, t uh, sorry if t 3 and t 2 is same or not. So, basically t 2 contains n and in t 3 we are incrementing that means, how many times I will multiply that. So, t 3 has been incremented with 1. So, we are checking these two if that is so, then we are setting this to 0. So, branch if not equal then it will go out. So, this particular these statements are getting executed repeatedly. So, when we are executing these statement repeatedly for what we are doing? We are calculating factorial. For calculating the factorial, we are using this particular assembly language code. Now, in this assembly language code as I have mentioned, these are loaded and we are repeatedly multiplying and then adding and finally, checking. So, these four instruction in the loop are executed more frequently than other. So, these are executed only once and then we might not require it, but you see these instruction will be required the number of times you have to find the factorial. Suppose, let us say you have to find the factorial of 5, then 5 times this will get executed till we multiply 1 into 2 into 3 into 4 into 5. So, for that reason this temporal locality says that because of loop structure, these instruction will not be required for us to bring it from a slower memory, because we will bring it once from slowest memory to fastest memory and then we will keep it there. So, this is temporal locality, this is an example of temporal locality. Now, let us see spatial locality. So, instruction residing close to recently executing instruction are likely to be executed soon. That means, this instruction is in close proximity of other instruction. So, if I am bringing this particular instruction, it is also better that we bring some more instruction which is in the close proximity of this instruction. So, instead of just bringing one instruction. So, let us see this accessing an array as I said sum equals to 0 for k equals to 1 to n sum equals to sum plus a of k. So, what we are doing here? We are subtracting t 1 from t 1 and we are keeping it here. We are adding an immediate value n is kept in t 2. Uh, we are initializing 1 to t 3 and we are initializing a that is this particular 
value first address to T 5. Now, what we are doing? We are actually loading this particular address. Now, A of k, A of k will have when we are saying load word in T 8 0 dollar T 5, then the value pointed by T 5 that where we have stored A will be loaded here. And then what we are doing? We are adding T 1 with 8, because the value from A of first k, where k is 1, A of 1 is loaded in T 8, I am adding with T 1 and storing it in T 1. And then I am adding T 3 with 1 more and then we are comparing T 3 and T 2, whether it has reached n or not, because we have to do it till n. So, if it has reached, then we are just coming to in the next loop, we are checking if it is 0, the, if it is not 0, then uh, we are going back here and again doing the same steps and again uh, checking here. So, we are repeatedly doing these sets of instruction. So, as because of the loop, if this array element 1 to n, if it is already brought in into the memory, then it will be easy, because at every time we are accessing that. So, performance can be improved by copying the array into cache memory. Instead of bringing one one value of the array, we bring the entire array into the cache memory. So, performance of memory hierarchy. Let us see this. Uh, we first consider a two level hierarchy consisting of two levels of memory, say M 1 and M 2. So, we have two levels, CPU is first hitting M 1 and if that is found here, it will take the uh, send the data to CPU and if it is not found, it is brought from here to here and then may be transferred here. So, how we can calculate the cost? Let C i denote the cost per bit of memory M i and S i denote the storage capacity in bits of M j. So, S i denotes the storage capacity and C i denotes the cost per bit of M i. So, the average cost per bit of the memory hierarchy is given by cost of C will be equal to C 1 S 1 plus C 2 S 2 divided by S 1 plus S 2. So, we are multiplying individual C i cost of per bit using the total storage which is available, finally dividing by the total capacity, storage capacity. In order to have C equivalent to C 2, we must ensure that S 1 is much, much less than S 2. So, what we are trying to say is that uh, C, what is the cost? We are saying that cost will be roughly equivalent to C 2, that is cost will be should be lesser, but for that we must ensure that S 1 is much, much lesser than S 2. The size of S 1, M 1 memory uh, should be less than storage of M 2. Coming to hit ratio or hit rate, what do you mean by that? The hit ratio H is defined as the probability that a logical address generated by the CPU refers to information stored in M 1. By this what we mean is that, so we have two levels. So, let us see this this is your CPU and you have M 1 level and you have M 2 level. And we are saying the CPU will be hitting this particular memory first. That means, hit ratio means CPU will hit M 1 and it will get the data from M 1 that is hit ratio. So, you see this that CPU will be hitting M 1 and it will say that the percentage time the data is found in M 1 that is the hit ratio. So, let us see this. The hit ratio is defined H as the probability that the logical address generated by the CPU refers to the information stored in M 1. That means, the data which I am looking for is present in M 1. 
We can determine H experimentally as follows. A set of representative programs is executed or simulated. Then the number of references to M1 and M2 is denoted by N1 and N2 respectively. And then hit ratio can be number of times it is found in N1 divided by total number of time it is found in M1 and number of times it is not found in M1 that is N1 plus N2. So, the quantity 1 minus H is called the miss ratio that means the number of times it is not found in M1 cache and M1 and H is the hit ratio that means N1 times it is found in level 1 divided by total number of access which you are making that is N1 plus N2 and of course, 1 minus H will be the miss ratio. Okay. So, now let us see the access time. Let T A 1 and T A 2 denote the access time of M 1 and M 2 respectively relative to C P U. Now, what by this we are meaning that access time of this M 1 is T A 1 and access time of M 2 is T A 2. These are the two access time of M 1 and M 2. So, how we can actually tell the average time required by C P U to access the word. So, what is the average time that we will require? Now, you see average time can be considered as T A which is equals to. So, first with the probability that it is found in cache then the time required will be T A 1. So, hit rate that is H multiplied by access time of T A 1 that is percentage time the data which the CPU is looking for is found in M 1 cache plus the number of time the data is not present in cache. So, it will be the miss rate 1 minus H and now the data is present in M 2 cache. So, you have to take access time of T A 2 or we can say this T A 2 or time for miss basically. Let us see this. T A will be expressed as hit ratio into access time of level 1 ca level 1 memory first hierarchy that is M 1 plus 1 minus H into time for miss. That means, this time will not only be the access time of M 2, but some time we are also spending looking here that is T A 1 that should also be taken into consideration. So, here miss denotes the time required to handle the miss called the miss penalty. So, by miss penalty what we are trying to say is that, that we are not getting the data in M 1, but we are finding in M 2, but what is the time we are spending that we have not found in M 1 and we are finding in M 2, that total time will be the miss penalty. The miss penalty T miss can be estimated in various ways. Let us see that. The simplest approach is to set T miss as T A 2 that is when there is a miss the data is accessed directly from M 2. So, a request for a word not in M 1 typically causes what? A block containing the requested word to be transferred from M 2 to M 1. After completion of the block transfer, the word can be transferred, can be accessed by M 1. Okay. So, what we are trying to say here is that uh, in a simple fashion we can say the access time of M, M 2 will be taken that is a miss penalty, but you see that access time should be like uh, you are accessing a particular word but generally we do not transfer a single word rather we transfer a block of word. So, the block containing that particular word should be transferred to the cache and then from the cache it will be transferred to the processor. 
So, this is what is said a request for the word not in M 1 typically causes a block containing the requested word to be transferred from M 2 to M 1. So, first the block, it, block is transferred from M 2 to M 1 and after completion of the block transfer the word can be accessed in M 1. So, T b denotes the block transfer time. So, we can write T miss as T b the block transfer time plus T a 1 because then you are we have to access the cache uh, access the uh, level 1 uh, memory hierarchy that is M 1 again that is T a 1. Since T b is much much larger than T a, so roughly we can say T a will be H into T a 1 plus 1 minus H into T b plus T a 1. So, this can be further written if T hit denotes the time required to check whether there is a hit we can write because see we will be seeing that how we perform the checking. Checking is also done because we have to check that whether that particular word in cache. So, that time is also should be taken into consideration. So, if that time is taken into consideration, then the T miss can be also written as T hit denotes the time required to check whether there is a hit or not plus T b block transfer time from M 2 to M 1 and then access time from M 1 to processor that is T a 1. So, these are the various ways through which miss penalty can be estimated. Now, what is efficiency? Let us consider R. R is uh, denotes the access time uh, ratio of the two levels that is T a 2 and T a 1. We define the access efficiency as what is the access efficiency? T a 1 divided by T a which is the factor by which T a differs from its maximum possible value. So, efficiency is T a 1 divided by T a and what is T a? T a is the average access time. So, if T a is the average access time we have already found it out that is equal to H into T a 1 plus 1 minus H into T a 2. So, if we divide by T a 2 we will get 1 divided by H plus 1 minus H T a 2 by T a 1. So, if, uh, if we get T a 2 by T a 1 that is R. So, 1 minus H into R it is coming down to that. Now, coming to speed up. The speed up gained by using memory hierarchy is what? What is the speed up? Time old divided by time new. What is time old? Earlier we were not using cache memory, not using any memory hierarchy basically. So, in that case the access time will be equivalent to the M 2 M 2 memory. So, the access time of M 2 memory is T a 2. So, it will be T a 2. So, time old is T a 2 and what is time new? After incorporating cache we have got the access time as T a. So, we get this as T a. So, T a will be the average access time that we have got by incorporating cache which is the new time now. Earlier it was taking T a 2 uh, and after incorporating another level we are getting T a. So, we can write this as uh, T a 2 by H into this equals to 1 divided by H divided by R plus 1 minus H. So, the same result follow from Amadel's law as well. So, here we are making an improvement percentage time the cache can be improved. So, there are some common terminologies uh, which we must know for rest of the lectures for this week. What is block? The smallest unit of information transferred between two levels. Hit rate the fraction of memory accesses found in upper level time the time to access the upper level. So, upper level access time plus to ta time to determine the hit or miss this is very important. First we have to determine that whether there is a hit 
or there is a miss and after that we will also consider the upper level time. So, hit time basically comes with two component which is upper level access time plus time to determine hit or miss. Next is miss data item needs to be retrieved from a block in the lower level that is from M2 to M1. Miss rate the fraction of memory accesses not found in upper level and what is the miss penalty? The overhead whenever a miss occurs. So, what is the overhead you are paying when there is a miss occur, when there is a miss. So, time to replace a block in upper level plus time to transfer the missed block. This comes with the miss penalty. So, these are some of the terminologies that we will be using throughout this uh, week 6 lectures. Thank you.